Your Excellency, you have some tasks to perform. So please come back to the stage. I have been requested to ask the climate envoy from America who is scheduled to take a flight to take a few moments and come and speak to us. My good brother John Kerry is somewhere in this audience. Welcome because he also has a declaration to make and an announcement to make. Welcome John. President, Mr. President, uh, distinguished presidents, your excellencies, fellow ministers, colleagues, friends, ladies and gentlemen, I have a feeling that uh, after that extraordinarily powerful presentation by President Ruto, uh, nobody should say anything. We should just act. Um, Maybe I should start by just saying jumbo. It works. Um, Mr. President, thank you for convening everybody here. Uh, over the years, I've been privileged, Mr. Secretary General, like you, uh, we've been at many of these conferences, and the words come easily. The actions seem to have been more difficult over time. It's a great honor for me to be able to be here uh, representing President Biden at this very important summit. And I want you to know as I listened, and as you listened, I could feel this room, something is happening. This is different. I feel that. This is different. I think, Mr. President, I would just say to you, your leadership is palpable. We feel it. What you have said today, there is such a clear path ahead for all of us. Africa is meeting. Africa is speaking. Africa is deciding. And nothing could make a greater difference, I think, on a global basis, given what you just heard from the President about the remarkable resources that are here in Africa, about the young people who are thirsty, hungry, for a future. And so Africa and this moment offer an enormous opportunity. This problem that we are facing is human made. It's about pollution. It's not very complicated. It doesn't take a rocket scientist or a mathematician or equation work to its end in order to understand what's happening. Humanity is threatened by humanity, by the decisions that we are unwilling, it seems, to make. So, at this moment, I believe it is clear that Africa presents some of the greatest opportunity in the world. To do what? To win this battle about how we heat our homes, drive our vehicles, light our factories and our homes. This is about fundamental production of energy. And if we will make the right choices about that, the future is different for everybody. That's what's so attractive and important about what President Ruto was saying. You want to have a cleaner life? You want to have a healthier life? Less cancer? Eliminate 8 million people dying every single year because of the lack of quality air that we breathe? All of that comes from the unabated burning of fossil fuel. And it is challenging, if not threatening, our very planet that we all live on. So 20 countries produce 80% of all the emissions. Mine is one of them. 20 countries. And it is critical for all of those 20 countries to immediately take steps to get on the path to the Paris Agreement, to align, to have the ability to keep 1.5 degrees alive. That will only happen if those 20 countries take the lead and make it happen. The crisis now is also 
if, if justice is to mean anything, it certainly has to mean that if there's going to be a transition, everybody has to be able to share in the benefits of that transition. And right now, it is clear that you can't talk about a trust transition, about a just transition, when some people, there's no transition at all. Or when some people, there is acute, unfair debt that swallows and drowns the choices that those countries have to make. My friends, adaptation, which wasn't on the front burner in the early years that we've been working at this, but it is now and it should be, for the simple reason that without adequate adaptation, we don't make it. That's the predicament that we've created for ourselves for where we are now. And so adaptation is critical and the damage Mother Nature is telling us on a weekly, daily basis. Every, every 18 days, we have a $1 billion climate event somewhere on this planet. So adaptation is critical. President Biden has now launched a program called PREPARE, the President's Emergency Program for Adaptation. And he has committed that we are going to help at least a half a billion people in developing countries, especially in Africa, to be able to adapt to the worst impacts of this crisis. He has committed the United States to work alongside African nations to lead the way in adapting to and managing the impacts of the climate crisis. And as part of PREPARE, he is providing or will fight with the Congress and guarantee that we will provide $3 billion annually for adaptation for the $12 billion program that he believes is essential in order to be able to do our part to adapt to this challenge. It is why we are working with partners on the Transitional Committee this year to design an effective fund to help vulnerable developing countries respond to loss and damage. And it is why last year in Sharm El Sheikh, the President decided that the United States needed to try to accelerate that process. And we joined with our friends in Europe and elsewhere to say that no, it's not adequate to do that over a two-year period, we need to close out and understand where we're going with the Loss and Damage Fund in one year, this year, when we all meet in Dubai. So in addition, uh, as part of implementing PREPARE, I'm pleased to announce today also, we're going to provide an additional $30 million for climate resilient food security efforts across Africa. First, $20 million to the Africa Adaptation Initiative for the Food Security Accelerator, and that will invest in agricultural businesses and help them create their own independent climate resilient supply chains. Second, $10 million will go to the Climate Resilient Adaptation Finance and Technology Transfer Facility to scale technologies so that we can advance adaptation efforts like cold chain storage, which uh, would help maintain the quality and the safety of food from the farm all the way to the homes of people in the world. We've learned that adaptation saves lives, creates jobs, and obviously it's just plain old common sense. Roads and bridges that are built today can only spur growth and curb poverty if they're still standing tomorrow. So in many ways, we have learned Africa. Africa suffers to a great degree the worst impacts of the climate crisis. And it is essential that every country step up to help other nations, and particularly Africa at this point, in order to be able to adapt to the climate impacts. But at the same time, we also have to continue to mitigate, and I think you all understand that. Of the 12, of the 20 most impacted countries in the world, 
17 are in Africa. That tells the story. We all have a moral obligation in the rest of the world, and particularly the developed world, the world that has those 20 countries with the biggest economies. We have a fundamental imperative for all of us to get this job done. Ladies and gentlemen, I am personally convinced we are going to get to a low-carbon, no-carbon economy. I see incredible things happening around the world. With the IRA in the U.S., we are breaking new ground on battery storage, on new technologies for wind turbines that will get 30, 40 megawatts of power from one turbine, new technologies for accelerating the transition with hydrogen and so forth, all of the things that President Ruto talked about. The vision that your president has put forward today is not just a vision for Africa. It's a vision for the world. And president Ruto is showing a path for everybody to follow, and I hope everybody will feel impacted by what he has said here. One of the great philosophers, I just close by sharing this with you, one of the great philosophers of the Enlightenment, when people decided that they would listen to science and not be browbeaten into somehow believing that everything was the sort of result of a vengeful God punishing people for their sins. But people decided and understood certain scientific facts make a difference. And they're real. And that has guided us for the centuries since then. Those pathfinders helped us to understand how to break ground and build a world in which we can have vaccines and, and uh, uh, deal with new technologies and go to the moon and so forth. We can win this battle. But we only win it if we make some fundamental decisions. Immanuel Kant, one of the great philosophers of that time, wrote, science is organized knowledge. Wisdom is organized life. Well, right now, if you look around you at the life we all lead all around this planet, the science and the knowledge are unequivocal. All that is left for us is to summon the wisdom to organize the world to do what we know we have to do. That's the vision that I heard from President Ruto, and that is the vision that I'm convinced will come out of this week of great effort at this summit, which can help to prepare for a groundbreaking COP at which we do the job people are asking us to do. Thank you very much. Excellencies, uh, we are moving on to a very uh, important uh, session where we will be listening to each and every one of you as you make your national statements. But uh, a few minutes before that, I want to usher in Zain to, um, and Your Excellency uh, President uh, William Ruto to undertake a signing ceremony here, and then we move on to the national statements. Thank you, Excellences. Thank you very much, Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. This is a very significant moment in the Africa Climate Summit. We are going to start this Green Revolution 